This is a solution for small GCD, problem D, from Code Forces 911. So, just to quickly look at the summation that is provided, oftentimes when you're given some sort of formula like this, you want to understand kind of what exactly it means and be able to describe it in words, basically. Because having a general understanding of what some function like this means is going to help you a lot more in visualizing a solution for the problem. Right, so this is a formula we're given where f at a, b, and c is equal to the GCD of the smaller of the two numbers. So what this means is that um, I'll just say GCD A, B, where we assume A and B are both less than or equal to C. And we want to find this quantity over here. Clearly, um, since N can go up to 80,000, computing this naively would TLE, and not even a quadratic solution will work either. So we have to find some way to compute the summation so that the overall runtime is either linear or close to linear, or maybe even harmonic, something like n log n. So let's look at the constraints on not just n, in this case n is 80,000, so 8 times 10 to the 4, but the maximum value of an element is also, well, the maximum value is um, 10 to the 5, so 100,000. Now, because this problem deals with a GCD function and whatever, and we kind of have to um, find the sum of all of these GCD values, it kind of makes sense to immediately assume that we're going to be using um, a sieve in some sort of capacity. And what a sieve is, is it's basically a way to pre-compute um, prime factors of any number from 1 to x in x log x time. So in this case, because the maximum value is 10 to the 5, we can pre-compute um, prime factors in 10 to the 5 log 10 to the 5 time. In other words, n log n. So, so far so good. So let's just go ahead and kind of assume we're doing that in some sort of way. We're not exactly sure how we're going to use that yet, but we can kind of use that as a first step to the solution. Now, to actually look at what this does, um, well, I forgot to write down the condition that i is strictly less than j and j is strictly less than k. So this basically just means that we count every triple exactly once. So no distinct triple is going to be counted more than once or less than once. So because of that, um, it doesn't actually matter what order we consider these values into the function f. In other words, it doesn't matter if we put in f at a at j, and then f at a at i, and f at k, a at k, because the way that it's defined here, um, the order of our parameters don't matter. In other words, if we were to sort this array, then this value would stay the same as the original array. So let's also sort the array, and let's keep track of what our runtime looks like. So sorting the array is n log n time, and computing the smallest prime factors for all possible values. Um, I'm going to define this as v, and that's going to be v log v time. So these are our runtime so far. The reason why we sort the array is because it allows us to get rid of some extraneous information. So if we assume that a at k is the largest element in this function, then this basically means that we can just completely ignore it because the largest element of the three that are passed into function f does not affect the quantity at all. So this basically means that um, if we were to fix a middle element a at j, so let's say a at j 
were equal to, let's say if n was equal to 10 and a at j was equal to 7, and this is, and for the sake of this, I'll one index everything. Then if we assume that k is always larger than j in the triple that we're considering, then that means, um, well, we have a choice of i that is unsure yet, but it has to be 1 through 6. We have j, which is just equal to 7. And then we have choices of k, which can be either 8, 9, or 10, so 8 through 10. It doesn't actually matter what the value of a at k is, because it's guaranteed to be the maximum value after sorting. So whatever contribution we get from having this middle index of j equals 7, we can just take this part and simply turn it into um, n minus j. So we can just multiply this by whatever the contribution we calculate over here. And this is useful because we've essentially eliminated one of these indices that we have to worry about. In, in other words, we've gotten rid of one of these summations. So now we have an easy way to calculate this quantity in quadratic time, which is still not good enough, but it's definitely a step in the right direction. So with that being said, let's now focus on indices i and j. Let's fix any index j. In this case, we can just say j equals 7. And in that case, i has to be any index 1 through 6. And because a at k is guaranteed to be the largest element, um, the contribution of this triplet is always going to be the GCD of a at i, where i can be 1, or 1 through 6, and a at j, where a at j in this case would be equal to 7. So if we have some way to store this information, to find this information quickly, then we're done with the problem. However, we run into a bit of an issue here because if we wanted to compute um, this quantity explicitly for every index of j, then it's actually very hard to do that because, um, and the reason why that's the case is because you would have to factor um, the element a at j and then for each of those factors, you have to maintain some sort of count of how many numbers to the left of it um, are divisible by some number. And finding that count initially is actually not that hard. But what's hard is um, accounting for overcounting. Because it's very easy to find, say, with a sieve, it's very easy to find um, how many numbers in an array are a multiple of some value d, but it's a lot harder to calculate efficiently how many values in this array have a maximum, or basically a GCD of d. Because if we just use a sieve, there's no way to properly determine whether this quantity would be equal to 2 or 4, because in the sieve's eyes, both of those would be counted as a multiple of 2 and that would incur overcounting. So because it's hard to deal with overcounting in the moment, let's just not worry about it for now. In other words, let's just consider, um, rather than counting the contribution of the GCD and multiplying it, this value of the GCD by how many pairs um, have this GCD value, Let's just focus on counting pairs. So the new problem that I want to think about is, is there a way or an efficient way we can count for some value d, and I'll write this out, for um, int d, find number of pairs so that um, the pairs GCD score is a multiple of D. And it turns out that 
This is actually quite easy to find efficiently using a sieve because what we can do is we can just iterate through every factor of a of j. And for each of these factors, um, we just count how many um, values to the left of it have that count um, of a multiple. And it might be a little bit easier to explain with code, so I'll put that up here. Um, but yeah, just to quickly summarize um, what I meant by that. Um, we can use, let's cause consider a count array. Count at um, x is gonna store for any index. So in other words, if we're currently um, looking at index j, then this is gonna store for all elements from i to j minus one. In other words, all the candidates for i, the variable. So from one to j minus one, my bad. But count at x is gonna be equal to um, number of elements in the in a from one to j minus one such that um, that element, so I'll just define it as a i mod x is going to be equal to zero. And we can count this using a sieve because we can generate the frequency array of the, in, or the, the frequency counts of this entire array initially. And then we can use um, a sieve to just count for every possible value of x how many, um, just sum up all the frequencies on these indices. And this would run in v log v time because of harmonic series. And after we find this count variable, um, for every candidate of j, we can go in decreasing order. And for every candidate of j that we decrease, we just factor a at j and then um, manually decrease the count, where the count values respectively. And we can use these count values to keep track of how many pairs exist. And specifically, the formula would look something like this. So if we have it defined in terms of count, then for every factor of a at j, I'm going to let f be a factor of a at j, so that a at j mod f is equal to 0. Then what's going to happen is that we want to store a final array. I'm going to call this, um, I called it dp because it is kind of a dp, but dp at x is going to store this quantity over here that we're looking for. The number of pairs, um, such that pairs dcd is a multiple of d. Oh, I guess in this case I use d. Yeah, dp at d is going to be equal to um, count at f multiplied by um, n minus j. And it's going to be the sum of all of possible f's. In other words, it's the sum of over all factors of a and j. And this is going to tell us this quantity over here. And once we iterate this for all choices of index j, the last thing we need to do is to eliminate complementary counting because if we can obtain the quantity that for some int d, find the number of pairs such as the pairs pcd is exactly equal to d, then we have our answer because we can just calculate dp at d multiplied by d and then find the sum of that over all d's. And that's our solution. And um, there is a standard way that you can um, eliminate this complementary counting or through complementary counting. Um, I'm not going to dive into the exact proof or explain exactly how this works, but just know that this code snippet right here does the trick. Um, where after you apply this to the DP array, it's all the values are going to turn into the values are going to take on the case where dp at d is going to be equal to the number of pairs whose gcd is exactly equal to d. 
which also explains why I'm adding dp at d times d to res, because res is just the final answer for each test case.